Okay, so a couple semesters ago, I started this little tradition, and uh, I made a, a passing comment in front of my kids at the dinner table about how it would be nice to lighten it up a little bit and tell some jokes, and so they decided they'd write me jokes. And so they got busy, and they wrote me a stack of jokes. Oh <laughs> and, um, and some of them are from, uh, they borrowed from places. Others, they wrote themselves, and I, sometimes you can tell the difference, but uh, they make you laugh, you know. And keep in mind, this is, this is all the way from five, the youngest is five, and the oldest is twelve, so and there's a little bit of a range here. But they're all appropriate for a general audience, so don't worry about that. Yeah, you ready for the first one of the semester? What did the cat say after his friends asked him to speak up? Wow, yes. No guesses. By the end of the semester, you'll start guessing at what. Can you hear meow? I thought that one was pretty appropriate based upon her microphone issue. All right. How about this one? One more? What did one eye say to the other? I see you. I like that. Yeah. Although, I mean, how do you... <laughs> Just between you and me, something smells. <laughs> At least you got it, though. It was a little late, but better late than never. Okay. Should we talk some science? No, just more jokes. Look, Keller, you got a whole stack of them. Yeah, we're going to do like two every meeting. And I'll condition you. I know if I forget, you guys will remind me that uh, I forgot to tell the joke. So I'm really not funny. I have to use props in order to be funny. So, But thanks to my children, I've become a much more humorous individual. That's, what, that's the one thing that kids do to you. There's a few others, too, but we won't talk about that. All right. We're still in this review section. Um, you know, I hope that you guys uh, can interpret, really, the message behind mine of being here from the publisher is that we want to make sure that we get your questions answered and we, we can solve your challenges. So if you have an issue, bring it up. Right? The worst we can say is, you know what, there's nothing we can do about that. I'm sorry, we can't help there. But I would at least try Okay, um, so we're a little bit behind, but we'll get caught up in the next uh, two lectures. We'll be caught up. About this time, students say, "Oh, he's way behind." Um, I wonder if if the exam's going to move. No, the exam won't change because some of you have plans scheduled around those exams, like I have. Okay. So I want to honor that. I want to do that as best I can. And so I think it's kind of unfair when I start moving exams around if I can avoid it. Some things do happen on occasion, and you can't always predict the future. But um, we will get caught up in the stuff that we don't cover. If that's the case, it won't be on the exam. And we'll talk more about that as time goes on. At this point, though, hopefully you are plugged into an SI session. You've got a routine time. I just got an email from a student that was in this class last semester saying that they're going to email one of the SIs because they're looking for a letter of recommendation. I thought that was an interesting twist. Because this student actually spent more time with an SI than they did with me. And so they said, well, I, don't, I know that you might not be able to write a reasonable letter because you may not know me that well. Um, what do you think about me reaching out to the SI? Um, because I attended their SI like, you know, a couple times a week. So that's a brilliant idea, because I bet they know an awful lot about you. So, again, these are supplemental instructors. They're in a role being paid to actually deliver instruction, so I would use them. Okay, and that's just evidence that they are at this level where students recognize their value, and they're saying, well, maybe they'll vouch for me. I'm applying for a scholarship. Maybe I could ask for a letter of rec. Okay. I want you to um, turn to the person next to you and, and one identify as A and the other one identify that you're B and answer these two questions. Explain the pH scale, A to B, what the numbers define, what the scale means, and then person B needs to explain what buffers are. Okay?
for today? Who's got a, a good definition of pH? The pH scale, what is it? The first part. Um, the, the pH scale is a way of measuring the either acidity or basicity of any given substance. If you're at 7, you're exact, and if you're anywhere below 7, you're acidic. If you're anywhere above 7, you're basic. It's a logarithmic scale. As you go either up or down, the pH scale, you're always increasing or decreasing in, uh, in your acidity or basicity exponentially. Exponentially, very good. Okay. Um, did you have anything to add in front? No. No? Okay, got it. <laughs> it, was well, it was well described. You nailed it. Okay. How about person uh, B? What's a buffer? Yes, sir. That's actually really good. Um, it is a solution or a substance that goes into solution that helps to protect it from massive swings in pH. Okay, buffers. So even though an acid solution is added, if the buffer is present, it can actually help neutralize the free hydrogen ion. So the only thing I'd add to the pH scale, it is a negative logarithmic scale of the free hydrogen ion concentration in that solution. So the more free hydrogen that's not bound to something, okay, the more acidic, and therefore the smaller the number, because it's a negative logarithmic. Okay? All right, pretty good. We did a pretty good job there as a group, a group of three, <laughs> okay? But still, so if you look at this, as we described, Water is neutral, a 7 of neutral, perfect. Scale goes from um, 0 to 14. The 0 would be the acidic side, and the 14 would be the basic side. The dissociation uh, scale is shown there. That's the equation. So pH is equal to this negative logarithmic scale, or logarithm, of the free hydrogen ion concentration. Those brackets mean concentration. So in other words, the more free hydrogen ion that is present, the smaller the number. You with me? That's how you read that formula. Those of you that are formula challenged. Okay? That's why we're going to be biologists. Right? Math is, thank goodness for smartphones, right? Okay. So if you have more hydrogen ion, uh, then the concentration is higher and the pH value is lower or it's more acidic. Let's look at some examples. So this, this is a review from uh, basic chemistry, from high school chemistry. You probably have this. But if we look at pure water, it should be at 7. If you look at the basic side, you can see items like ammonia and bleach that are rather basic. A larger numbers. You can see that lye, which is an oven cleaner, or sodium hydroxide, uh, rather basic. And then over here, some of the things that we actually eat are actually more acidic. Like, it, you know, wine and lemon juice, and here's our stomach acid, hydrogen chloride, which is at about a pH of 1. So, the scale of acidic all the way up to basic and what they represent. Interestingly enough, so the body is going to regulate pH very tightly. And we have buffers built into our system to help manage or prevent large fluctuations in pH swings. In a large fluctuation, because it's a negative logarithmic scale, a pH of 6 versus a pH of 7 seems like a small number, but it's kind of like the Richter scale on earthquakes. How many of you felt the earthquake just a couple of months ago here in Flagstaff. Some of you are like, there was an earthquake? Like, you were sleeping? It was, it was probably, or you were in a, you know, you were out on the town and the music was so loud you didn't feel it because it was pretty late at night. What was it like? Just around midnight, maybe 11.30 p.m., something like that. Uh, so how many of you felt that? Those of you that didn't, how many from Southern California? and are very familiar with life with Richter, right? Okay, 
So, like a 6.0 on the Richter scale versus a 7.0, there's a big difference, right? More stuff falls off the wall, and the wall might fall in a 7. And with a 6, it's far less aggressive, less aggressive, even though it's only a change of 1. So that's kind of how to look at the pH scale is small fluctuations are actually big swings in free hydrogen ion. So, for example, your blood pH fluctuates very tightly in its control. Remember the negative feedback loop? The pH of the blood fluctuates between, it's about 7.4, plus or minus about a 0.5. So 7.35 to 7.45 is where normal blood pH will actually oscillate. Very tightly controlled. Just slightly basic. But if it gets below like a 7.3 or a 7.2, uh, this can be very dangerous. To the patient, even though it's a small fluctuation. So, just an example, a more clinically applied example of why pH matters, because maybe in basic chemistry, uh, it's like, I don't, I don't really care that much. If, if it's got skull and crossbones on it, I don't drink it. Okay? I'm good. I don't even know what the pH is. Well, if your patient brings, if you bring back blood panels from your patient, and you're reading that information, and you see the pH is off a little bit, that's going to tell you that something is dramatically wrong. Likewise, if you measure a temperature and their temperature is 106, you're going to say something's not right. Okay, so these can be huge warning signs that will be important. Okay, moving on. We're switching gears a little bit into different types of organic molecules. The last time we were together, I was talking about inorganics and organics, and we were kind of poking fun of the fact that one is not better than the other. They're both needed. They're both critical for life. Just because you have organic molecules doesn't mean the individual is alive. An inorganic substance known as oxygen and carbon dioxide are not being exchanged. No life. It could be as much carbon as you possibly want, but that's all it is. But organic molecules are very important. We're going to talk about a few of them today. We're going to talk about carbohydrates and lipids. And we're talking about proteins and nucleotides. So as we move on and start talking about carbon-based molecules, now again, these are hydrogenated carbon-based molecules. They have hydrogen ions that are bound to them. So we already went through that definition. That's what defines it as being organic. But carbon itself is a very stable molecule. It can achieve four covalent bonds, which are very strong bonds. Very different than those weak hydrogen bonds that we see between um, water molecules. These are very stable bonds. And they also readily bind, carbon readily binds to other functional groups, usually denoted with an R symbol. Okay, so you can see when we draw these model diagrams, there's a couple of examples at the bottom here. A, B, C, D, and E are all the same molecule, CH4. But they're just noted a little differently, right? So this is a three-dimensional configuration. This is a 2D representation of a 3D model. Here's a different 3D model. Here's a 2D showing the four bound hydrogens. A lot of times we'll lose one of the hydrogens and we'll bind an R group, which is our functional group. So if we bind an R group up here, you can see the different uh, examples. An OH at the end would be a hydroxyl group. A lot of sugars have that look. Next up, our fats, uh, our oils, our steroids, and our amino acids. They have a CH3. Uh, further down, our carboxyl group. These are amino acids, sugars, and proteins. So you can see that the carbon is a basic building block. It's easy, kind of Lego style, to kind of take one piece off and put on a new piece and get a new thing. Uh, amino groups, NH2, those are amino acids and proteins. And then phosphate, and H2PO4 at the end, ATP, the basic fundamental energy form that we like as an organism. As well as other nucleic acids that we'll get to. So carbon likes to form rings. It likes to form these rings, which is a very efficient way to form a chain. And so, when it exists by itself, it's called a monomer. Mono meaning singular, one. 
If it forms a chain, we call it a polymer. Poly meaning many. So that prefix tells you an awful lot about what that word means. So for example, glycogen is a type of polymer. And specifically it's called a polysaccharide because a saccharide means sugar. But more generically it's considered a polymer where glycogen is thousands of glucose molecules which are monomers that are strung together. And when we create a polymer, we use a process known as polymerization. And this happens through a process known as the dehydration synthesis, which is shown here. You've got one monomer binding with a second monomer, forming a dimer, which means two. And it yields or gives off water as a byproduct. So we call it dehydration synthesis because you're actually dehydrating water out of the system and it elutes off as a byproduct. If you run the reaction, if you remember back to basic chemistry, if you run the reaction in the reverse direction and you cleave this bond, this is called hydrolysis or digestion, and you'll get two individual monomers. So we do this in our body all day long. We take glucose and we string it together into glycogen and we store that glycogen in the liver or in the muscle. Then when we need it, we cleave that bond and we liberate <coughs> glucose so that it can go through glycolysis. Remember glycolysis where you make ATP? So the process of dehydration synthesis or polymerization is just as important as hydrolysis or digestion where you go the opposite direction. Because in one way you're actually storing energy and the other way you're liberating glucose to make energy. So if we look a little further at the different types of carbohydrates, we have monomers, right? All of these are oses. These oses indicate that they're carbohydrates or sugar-based molecules. They're a quick energy source because um, they're very hydrophilic, so they dissolve in water readily, and they're readily available to go through glycolysis, which is a very fast process. Fast, quick energy. So that's a good thing for us as an organism. Now, we need longer-term energy as well. We need both types of energy, but the, the quick, early energy is, in, is, is incredibly important. So we've got three different formats. We have monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. What do you think the disaccharide means? Two. It's really not that complicated once you understand how to read them, right? So our example of monosaccharides are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Our example of uh, disaccharides is like sucrose, which is shown here. This is a glucose molecule, so you could say glucose is this one, plus fructose. That makes sucrose. That's table sugar. That's what you put in your coffee. Lactose, another type of disaccharide, is glucose plus a galactose. And then maltose, a third type of disaccharide, is a glucose plus a glucose. So a maltose is not quite on its way, or it's not quite there as a polysaccharide. Polysaccharides are this repeated many, many, many times, you know, across the wall. And some examples of polysaccharides, you would take maltose, you would continue to string on glucose monomers, and you make a polysaccharide. A many sugar is how it literally translates. Make sense? So if you have a many sugar, a polysaccharide, you cleave those bonds via digestion or hydrolysis. You chew it up, you make maltose, then you chew it up more and you make glucose. The glucose can go into glycolysis. Okay? Now, there are some other examples of polysaccharides other than glycogen, like cellulose and starch like amylose and amylopectin. So there are certain types of foods you can have a snack, and that snack might be just really chock full of sucrose or glucose, and it fills you up, but it burns very fast. You're hungry again. If you have a snack or a meal that has more starch in it, or roughage, it will last you longer because it takes longer for the digestion to take place. Okay. 
So the quick energies are usually the disaccharides and the monosaccharides, and the more long-term energies are the complex sugars, which we call polysaccharides. Let's look at fats, otherwise known as lipids. Instead of being hydrophilic, like sugar, you know sugar is hydrophilic because when you take sucrose, table sugar, and you put it in your coffee and you stir it, what happens? It goes into solution. Okay? If you reach for some um, canola oil and put that in your coffee and stirred it, what would happen? It would spoil the coffee, number one, so don't do that. I mean, that's just a waste of good coffee. But it'll float to the top, and you'll see it separate because it's hydrophobic. It's water-fearing. It doesn't like to go into solution. So <clears throat> lipids store about 9.3 kilocalories of energy per gram. They're a very preferred method of energy storage because they don't take a lot of water, really any water at all. So they're a lightweight way to store energy. That's why we as an organism store fat as an energy source. Glycogen as an energy source, down here, the polysaccharide, actually takes a lot of water in order for it to exist. So we'll only store so much energy in the format of glycogen. And then we convert it over to lipid storage. So you can see here uh, this phospholipid with a uh, hydrophobic nonpolar region and a hydrophilic. This is one example of a type of lipid, a special case example. Um, the configuration is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, the less oxidized these are, and I'll show you oxidation levels here in a minute, then the more energy they have and the more readily available storage energy you have to harness. So if we look at different states, for example, if we look at the types of lipids, we have fatty acids, we have steroids, otherwise known as sterols, we have what will come on to next is, in the next slide, triglycerides, phospholipids, and then a funny word known as eicosanoids. So let's talk through the five different types of lipids. First up, fatty acids. If we look at saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids, You've probably heard in, in, in diet speak or in nutrition classes, well, you know, I, I know that there are good fats and bad fats. Well, what does that really mean? Well, if you look at this diagram over here, do you see that there's a double bonded C here and a double bonded C here? So that double bonded C means that you could theoretically cleave that bond and add more hydrogen. So this is considered an unsaturated fat because it's not completely saturated with hydrogen. So, unsaturated means that it has some double bonded C's, it could take on more hydrogen, and a fully saturated fat would actually be covered completely with hydrogen, and you wouldn't see any double bonded C's where there's an opening for a hydrogen to bond. Okay? Remember, uh, carbon only has four binding sites, so a double bond takes up two of them. And then the other one on this side, right, is this hydrogen, and then the fourth one is that carbon next to it. <clears throat> These fatty acids are either saturated or unsaturated. It's the unsaturated type that tend to be better for us, these unsaturated fats. They're usually 4 to 24 carbons in length, and we find them in lots of different foods that we have. Many of the foods that we eat have fat in them, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You just don't want too much of it, not enough of everything else. You need a well-balanced meal. A lot of the fat diets that push you heavy one direction versus another can be dangerous. So you just have to be careful about the knowledge base of who's suggesting this type of diet. Okay? Uh, second group, steroids, otherwise known as sterols. Steroids are usually four-ringed molecules. The classic one that we're going to look at is cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is this picture down here. So this is an unsaturated fat up top and a cholesterol steroid as a base molecule on the bottom. Now, cholesterol is an important molecule. Many of you think that cholesterol is bad for you. Well, excessive amounts of cholesterol can be bad, but right now, as 
you are in your younger years and maybe still growing or you're still um, repairing because you're very active, having some cholesterol bioavailable is not necessarily a bad thing, especially for like my kids that are still growing. Because cholesterol serves a role in the cell membrane to enhance the integrity or the structural integrity of the cell uh, membrane. It helps to make it stronger. And so when you have a lot of cellular division and you have new cells being propagated, you need cholesterol available. Now, when you're 50, 60, 70, and 80 years of age, when all you're doing is really maintaining, do you need high levels of cholesterol? Not really. There's two types of cholesterol, right? There's your bad cholesterol and your good cholesterol. Well, what's the difference? Well, the bad cholesterol is usually referred to as low-density lipoprotein, which is LDL, right? Cholesterol is a fat. It's a type of steroid. Low-density lipoprotein is one that encourages cholesterol to leave the liver and float around in the bloodstream so that it can be available for new cells that are being propagated. HDL, high-density lipoprotein, is the type that takes the cholesterol into the liver for storage, so it takes it out of the bloodstream. That's why you always look at a ratio of high versus low density lipoprotein. Now, in young individuals, usually they're in check because they're being used up as fast as they're synthesized. Your body actually manufactures 85% approximately of all the cholesterol that you need in order to grow through all phases of your life. And in Western culture, we have lots of diets that are high in cholesterol, so that extra 15%, we can make up for that halfway through breakfast. Okay? And the rest of the day, we don't need any more cholesterol, but we do have it. So much of the cholesterol that we need as an organism, we actually manufacture ourselves. We manufacture it from lipid, from fat. Okay, the last three types of fat that we're going to look at, and then we'll move on to protein. We've got uh, triglycerides. <clears throat> triglycerides, which are usually a glycerol with three fatty acids. And they exist really in two main formats, oil and fat. What's the difference? It's a little arbitrary. But an oil is a type of triglyceride, a neutral fat, that is liquid at room temperature. So it's going to be like your canola oils or your Wesson cooking oils. Your fat types of triglycerides, really they're the same family of lipid, but these are the ones that are solid at room temperature. Okay, like your Crisco cooking oil. Phospholipids. We've talked a lot about phospholipids. Here's an example of a phospholipid. It's a neutral fat, for example, like a glycerol and three fatty acids, plus a phosphate group. These guys are sort of a special case. Instead of being uh, hydrophobic completely, these are the guys that have this dual nature of amphiphilic. They have a hydrophobic tail down here, and then they have a hydrophilic head. And as they self-assemble, and you remember back to basic bio, as they self-assemble in solution, because we as an organism are a solution, we're essentially a saline solution. We're about 50 to 75% water, and we have lots of sodium and chloride in our extracellular environment. And that is a salt water solution. Okay? And so when you drop a phospholipid into that environment, they self-assemble where the tails move away from the water and the heads like the water, and now you can actually create barriers. And that's really important for life to be able to create these barriers because now you can compartmentalize. As a multicellular organism, the ability to compartmentalize gives us the ability for specialization. So we have the ability to have a heart cell do something dramatically different than a skin cell versus a liver cell or a hepatocyte. And if you couldn't compartmentalize like that, you wouldn't have the ability for regional specialization like that. So the phospholipid bilayer we're going to talk about in the next lecture 
I know that you've learned about is kind of, some of you, it was like pulling teeth. It is a prereq basic introduction that is a fundamental important aspect for the human body. We didn't just do it because we wanted to torture you. It's actually critical to understand why those cell membranes have to be that way. And now, if you compartmentalize, you can actually move things selectively across at different periods of time. If you couldn't do that, you couldn't. I couldn't wave my hand at you. Okay? You couldn't take a breath. I couldn't speak. I couldn't walk across the classroom because action potentials have to have a barrier where you separate ions. And we'll learn about action potentials. And if you don't have an action potential, then you have never, never have muscle contraction. So the compartmentalization is a fundamental key principle that you need to nail. You need to get it. Otherwise, when we come to action potential, you're going to struggle. So now is the time to really go to SI and talk about, okay, let's go back to this fossil of bilayer thing. Because I, I kind of didn't really get it. Okay. All right. The fourth or fifth category, again, back to being hydrophobic. Again, the only one here that's amphiphilic is our fossil lipid. All the other ones are hydrophobic as lipids. They don't like water. This, these are eicosanoids. These are 20 carbon compounds. They're a, a structure of 20 carbons. And this is an example down here of prostaglandin. Some of you are like, what in the world is prostaglandin? Well, prostaglandin is a cytokine that's very important in cell signaling. It has huge roles in inflammation and blood clotting and even controlling or regulating blood vessel diameter of the body. It's one example of a family of eicosanoids. And as you move on in your studies, you'll learn about others, like leukotrienes and prostacyclines, and you'll learn about thromboxanes, and they all have roles about inflammation and managing blood vessel diameter, whether it's vasoconstriction or vasodilation. These eicosanoids are manufactured from a precursor known as arachidonic acid. Well, where does arachidonic acid come from? It actually comes from the cell membrane. You strip phospholipid from the cell membrane, you create a base molecule known as arachidonic acid, and then you manufacture all these family of eicosanoids that do all of these really important physiologic things in the body. You'll look at blood clotting next semester in 202. And when you see how elegant blood clotting is, if you can't appreciate how it works just right in you, talk to somebody that has a clotting disorder and ask them how difficult that is. And there's different uh, severities of different types of blood clotting disorders. Some of them are lethal, and those individuals never make it. They don't actually survive uh, childbirth. <clears throat> but those that do survive have some sort of uniqueness that they have to be careful about, whether it's, you know, they get cut when they're shaving, or a small little paper cut, or even worse, when they prepare for surgery later in life, that blood clotting uh, disorder could actually be a challenge, a big challenge. So eicosanoids, okay? All of these five examples are critical compounds that come from fats. Eicosanoids are kind of cool because you actually take a piece of membrane, make arachidonic acid, and then you crank out different families of eicosanoids. <clears throat> Let's move on to proteins and nucleic acids um, in this lecture. Here's our last couple of examples of organic compounds. There are others, but these are the fundamental important ones for um, basic A and P, as we're going to talk about these. <clears throat> Proteins are polymers. Remember, what is a polymer? Many chains, right? A string, like a, uh, a gold chain necklace or a silver chain necklace, right? Those links are all strung together. Well, like carbohydrates, proteins like to make chains, okay? You're going to see a lot of motifs in the body that when it works well in one location, it's used again and again and again. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Right? So we'll see morphologic architectural similarities in very different systems throughout the body. It's kind of cool. Here's an example at the fundamental basic building block. Carbohydrates and sugars 
are strung together in chains, just like proteins. Polymers of amino acids, there's 21 essential amino acids that we know of. And we can make thousands, literally thousands of different proteins from just those 21 amino acids. In fact, proteins were so valued at one point in time in history, in the 1950s, it was thought, and there were biochemistry textbooks that were published in 1952 on the Miller-Urey experiment. You can Google it. And they made claims that proteins and amino acids were the building blocks of life. And these were the, you might have heard a reference to these experiments where they created a, uh, a chamber and it was a vacuum chamber to mimic the early universe and they introduced amino acids and then they hit it with electricity. And they thought that they had created life out of like these Frankenstein type of, I mean these are like real, and they wrote biochemistry textbooks out of this. And then in 1953, right, Watson and Crick um, uh, published their work on DNA, and we'll get there next, and then they had to throw away those textbooks. Okay? That wasn't McGraw-Hill, don't worry, that wasn't even the first edition. <laughs> so these guys differ by the functional R group, and you can kind of see some examples over here, where we've got amino acid number one and amino acid number two. This one's got the R1 designation, this one has the R2 designation. They form a peptide bond and create a dipeptide. A dipeptide, like a dimer. A dimer was two sugars. A dipeptide is two amino acids strung together. Now we have some simple ones like glycine, and then we have some very complex ones that are super long chains of amino acids. We can attach an amino or a carboxyl group on them and create all these different varieties that are important for the different types of tissues that we create in our body. We are eventually getting here shortly, the next like three lectures to histology of tissues. We're going to start talking about things like collagen. We're going to talk talking things about like elastin. These are proteins. Well, they're made up of amino acid sequences. So is it important for you to understand like how are they made? Yeah, because if you don't understand and you can't appreciate that when you consume protein in your diet and you mechanically break it down by chewing it and then you chemically break it down via digestion, it breaks it down into at some level amino acids that are the building blocks to make new muscle because you exercise like crazy over the last two months because you're training for that marathon and that muscle that you're breaking down so that it builds back up, it needs these amino acids in order to do that. <clears throat> so we can describe them. Many times these are amphiphilic, kind of like the phospholipid is. They have a hydrophobic and they have a hydrophilic region. You're going to see in the next lecture when we talk about cell bio, these proteins like to stick themselves inside the membrane. They hide the hydrophobic region in the inner part of the membrane, and the hydrophilic region is exposed to the outside environment, the extracellular fluid. So they're a chain of amino acids created by these peptide bonds, and you can actually cleave these bonds. Uh, for example, one enzyme that we use in our body, you learn about in 202, is called pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that digests peptide bonds of protein. Okay? If you string them together, but you stay less than 15 amino acids, we call that an oligopeptide. If you string it in amino acid sequences greater than 15, we call it a polypeptide. It isn't until it exceeds 100 amino acids in sequence and length that it's designated as a protein or a protein sequence. Okay? So when you consume protein in your diet, you'll digest it into polypeptides, oligopeptides, as well as just individual amino acids. Yes, sir? Um, what if it's exactly 100? What if it's exactly 100 because I don't have like greater than or equal to? I'd probably call it a, a protein. Yeah, you could, you could add that right there. So that's the little insight that only you guys get here in lecture. If I wanted to be super tricky on the exam, I'd put this, you know, and then I'd put it with an equal sign. Only you guys would get it just because of this gentleman up front. Just kidding. But that's a great question. So these are kind of rough orders, to be quite honest.
Okay, because what do you do about 15? You didn't ask that one, huh? What is that? I don't know. It's like a, a Lego poly, you know. It's like that one's confused. Let's just put it that way. It doesn't know what it wants to be. Okay, so we have different structures of proteins. They like to arrange themselves in different architectures. We have primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary architecture. What does that mean? Well, the primary is just the amino acid sequence. It's the individual amino acids as they're strung together. Now, in the secondary, the secondary is where um, we start seeing alpha and beta sheets. Right? You can see that um, in this, this is an alpha helix. You start coiling it as you architecturally arrange it. When we start folding proteins, you get certain areas that were at the beginning of the chain that maybe start coming in contact with areas that were in the mid part of the chain. So as you fold in secondary and beta pleated sheets, alpha helices and beta uh, pleated sheets, you start getting a secondary sequence. Well, you can further fold them into a tertiary architecture where now you start really getting these big units of these alpha helices that if you stretch this protein out, this alpha helix and this beta pleated sheet would never be near each other. Who cares? Well, what if you move on and you start folding into a quaternary architecture where you get greater than two polypeptides that start folding together, now you get these complex architectures that form binding sites for certain types of molecules. Does anybody know what this is? That molecule right there? The quaternary architecture of that molecule? What is that molecule? Protein. It is a protein. That is true. In its quaternary architecture. It's hemoglobin. What is hemoglobin? It's it helps, in your blood. It helps your blood clot. It doesn't help your blood clot. It helps your blood carry oxygen. Okay? So, but it forms, you can see there's an alpha chain, there's a beta chain, two alpha chains, two beta chains, and this heme group. This heme group has iron in it. Iron has a ridiculous affinity for oxygen. Right? That's why rust forms. Right? Iron grabs oxygen out of the environment and turns it a brownish color. So this heme group that's functionally sitting in the architecture of this quaternary structure has an affinity for one oxygen molecule, two, three, and four. Each hemoglobin molecule can bind four, up to four, oxygen molecules. If you stretch this structure out, Heme doesn't attach, oxygen won't bind. Well, what would stretch this out or unfold the protein? We call that protein denaturation. You denature a protein mainly in two ways, heat or pH. So if the temperature of the organism is too high, you start denaturing proteins. If the pH is too inaccurate, too acidic or too basic, you could start denaturing proteins. That can start influencing your ability to carry oxygen. Want to bet you're now going to care about that in your patient? Okay? So these basic science fundamental principles that we've learned about actually do apply. It just isn't until this class that we kind of, you know, unveil how do they relate. So I want you to try it. Identify each level of structure. Go ahead and do this just real quick on some scratch paper, and we'll go over it. A bonus opportunity today? I'm just saying, hypothetically. You might do an activity like this and then turn this in to be graded. Does that make, that's how that works. And it only happens in class. Um, I'm just, I thought it was going out there. And three is primary. Okay, so let's go over this. 
Uh, which one of those is the primary architect, or primary sequence? Three. Three, very good. How about secondary? One. One, very good. How about tertiary? Two. Two, very good. And then for those that have been challenged thus far, this is for you. Which one is quaternary? Four. Four, very good. Not because it's the number four. Okay, it's because it's the only one left. Okay. It's also accurate. All right, so let's talk about proteins. That's a lot about proteins, Keller. Like, why do I care? They do a lot of important things. Here's their list of functions. Right? There's a list of seven functions, and that's not all of them. That's just as many as fit on the white space without making it overly busy. You know, there's publications on how to make a slide so that it's readable. There's all sorts of science behind that. Like, you know, how, how much text you put on a slide. So that's not all of them, but those are the ones I'm going to test you on. Proteins give rise to structure. They make up your bones, and they make up your muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Communication. They help from one cell to communicate to another. They actually have these adhesion molecules that allow them to talk. They transport things across the membrane. Remember, if you compartmentalize something, and you want to move something in, you need a way to get things in or out. They help to um, catalyze reactions because enzymes are proteins. I gave you an example of pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that digests peptide bonds. It breaks down peptide bonds, so it digests protein. If you remember, transport, would that be like an ion channel? Yes, an ion channel is a great example. Perfect example. They help with recognition and protection. All of your cells in your body with the nucleus have your name on them. Legitimately, like, hi, I belong to Rob. Because if you transplant one of your cells into me, my body will kill it. Not because I don't like you, but it <laughs> recognizes it for me, for me. So every cell in the body that's nucleated has what we call an MHC complex on it. That is a massive, major histocompatibility complex. That's what it stands for. And it is a protein. Okay? Movement. They help facilitate movement of cells from one area to another. They also help with cellular adhesion. Why would we care about that? Well, blood clotting. You need stuff to stick. Okay? Fighting off infections. Right? You need macrophages to go there and kill off the bacteria. You want them to adhere to the tissue and stay in place. Now, if we look at the three-dimensional architecture, and then I'll get to your question, um, we can see that in some places in the body, like with ion channels that was given up, we're going to see different types of changes that take place based upon a signal. That signal could be electricity. That would be voltage. We send signals of electricity in our body, but they're very small levels of what we measure in millivolts. Voltage is what comes out of the wall, right? And in, in, in some countries, it's higher voltage that comes out of the wall. In our body, it's actually millivolts, thousand order of magnitude less than the voltage out of the wall, okay? Or hormones can bind. Hormones can bind and trigger a conformational change to allow an ion channel to open. So we can open an ion channel with electricity, or we can open an ion channel with a, uh, a binding of a hormone. Now, why do we care so much about the three-dimensional architecture? Because if you change the heat or you change the pH of a protein, you can actually denature it. So everyone knows what this picture is on the lower left, right? What is that? An egg. An egg being cooked or probably pretty close. Depending upon your preference, it may be done, right? Some of you are like, that thing's done. Put it on my plate. I like them running. Others are like, ooh, that's gross. There's like this little white, you know, crappy, yucky stuff right there. <laughs> it's like, that's like one of my daughters. Like, yeah, that, that's not a good egg. You need to make that little slimy stuff go. <laughs> Is that you? That's, I have a couple of those anti-slimers. Um, but when you crack a raw egg, the main protein of the white is known as albumin. It's a very large protein. And what color is it when you crack open a rye? It's clear. It's clear. So when you heat it up, you denature it, and denaturing it actually makes it opaque. Okay, so that's 
an easy evidence. You could actually drop an egg, uh, a raw egg. You could put it into a beaker of acetone. You can get acetone, um, a nail polish remover. You can put raw egg in, in a beaker of nail polish remover and watch it turn white. Because that pH does the same thing as heat. It denatures that protein. And when we take hamburger or steak and we denature it over a grill, it actually hardens right, the protein, and that's denaturing the protein in that way. There's an appetizer, right, which, which is cooked fish, but cooking it with acid, like citric acid, right, ceviche. You've ever had this appetizer? A very nice uh, delicacy. Some of you are like, ooh, right? Um, but it's actually pretty good, and it's not dangerous because it actually is cooked, but it's cooked with acid. It's not cooked with heat. So just evidence that these proteins will completely change their shape and form if you denature them. And therefore, if they're functioning in these ways and you've denatured them, do they continue to function with those purposes? No. no absolutely not. Okay. If we look at protein function and enzymes, here's one way that we can characterize how these proteins function. Well, we've got... Uh, enzymes that help catalyze the reaction, they lower the activation energy of that reaction. So look here. This is sucrose as a substrate, table sugar, right? Glucose and fructose. Here's sucrase. Here's a hint. Anything that ends in ACE typically is an enzyme. So sucrase is the enzyme that breaks down the bond between glucose and fructose in the sucrose molecule, which is a disaccharide into its respective monosaccharides. And sucrase is this enzyme that helps catalyze this reaction. So proteins, as enzymes, could go along and break down lipids or sugars or other proteins, in the case of pepsin, and facilitate the ability to use those basic building blocks. Last in this lecture, but definitely not least, are nucleotides. So these nucleotides have three parts. They have a nitrogenous base, and the nitrogenous base shown here is the adenine up top. They have phosphate groups. This is a triphosphate, and then they have a ribose, or a sugar. This molecule on the right is known as adenosine triphosphate, affectionately referred to as ATP. It's a type of nucleotide. It's pretty important. Adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is the common energy currency for all cells in our body. And a lot of plants, too, right? Um, these are very unstable bonds, so every bond of phosphate is easily cleaved. Every time it's cleaved, it liberates energy. So there's three phosphates that we can cleave. If we move from ATP and we lose one phosphate, it's called ADP. Adenosine diphosphate, if we lose another one, it's AMP, adenosine monophosphate. We're going to see the cycling of ATP to AMP and then back to ATP as we talk about muscle contraction later in the semester. Because in order to contract a muscle, you need ATP, but you cleave the phosphates at different phases of muscle contraction in order to liberate different amounts of energy. Um, is it possible to lose all three phosphates? Yes, it is. Absolutely. And there are some cases where you need a lot of energy and you don't do it sequentially, you just do it all at once. Does that happen like only when someone's under extreme physical stress or when No, no, no. It happens throughout your daily life, like getting to class. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Um, but they're constantly recycled. So even though you lose all three, you'll bind back the phosphates to give you that next energy state as soon as you possibly can. Uh, but this is synthesized during glucose oxidation. So if we look at glucose oxidation, this is probably a slide or a mechanism that makes you a little nervous, right? You studied this at length. Glycolysis is shown up here. Glycolysis yields a net of two ATP. Cost two to run it, you get four. That means you have four minus two as a net is two. So on the exam, when I ask for how much 
net ATP do you get out of glucose or glycolysis? You're going to answer two. Well, glycolysis yields a net of two ATP and it's splitting sugar into two pyruvic acid molecules. If you have uh, oxygen available, you can shuttle this into the mitochondria, if you remember, and you can liberate an additional 36 ATP. Commonly, you get two out of the Krebs, and you get another 34 from the electron transport chain. So if you take one molecule of glucose in the presence of oxygen, you net a total, right, of 30 what? 38. Because you get 36 with oxygen, you get two out of glycolysis. So on the exam, if I say one glucose molecule goes through glycolysis and anaerobic respiration, yielding how many net ATP, you would answer 38. 36 from the mitochondria, two from glycolysis. Glycolysis happens where? In the cytoplasm. Okay? So, 36 out of aerobic respiration, two out of glycolysis. So, this is an example of why nucleotides are so important, or there are some other examples of the importance of nucleotides. For example, look, we've got guanine triphosphate, cyclic AMP, which is usually a second messenger. Both of these oftentimes are used as second messengers sending signals within the cell. And then down here, you've got nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. This is uh, the double helix shown on the right of a DNA strand, a sample DNA strand. And we know from Watson and Crick's work uh, that uh, this was really, that these are really the building blocks of life, not the proteins. Proteins are important. We just didn't know how important they were or where they fit. And in the 1950s, scientists were trying to figure all this out. Well, now we actually know the importance of what proteins do. We just spent time on that. And what nucleic acids do or nucleotides do. Questions? So, since 